Good morning, everyone, and welcome to EDP and Applied Mathematics Seminar. It's a pleasure for me to open session 81, this seminar. Uh, today, we have two excellent speakers, Sonia Martinez and Laurel Ho. Introducing Sonia Martinez, we have to Professor Chago Rox Oliveira. Thank you, Chago. You can start. Thank you, Juan, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Sonia Martinez. Uh, is one of the stars in control theory and control field. And I have a short video from, from her. I will, I will read this to you. Sonia Martinez is a full professor at the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at the DCFT and a Jacob Faculty Scholar. Professor Martinez received her BSc degree from the University of Zaragoza in Spain in 1997 and her PhD degree in engineering mathematics from the Universidad de Carlos III de Madrid, Spain, in May 2020. Following a year as a visiting assistant professor of applied mathematics at the Technical University of Catalonia, Spain, she obtained a postdoctoral Fulbright Fellowship and held the appointment at the Coordinate Science Laboratory of the University of Illinois at the Urbana campaign during 2004. And at the center, for control dynamic systems and computation of the University of California, Santa Barbara during 2005. From January 2006 to June 2010, she was an assistant professor with the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at the University of California, San Diego. From July 2010 to June 2014, she was an associate professor with the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at UCSD. Uh, her research interests include network control systems, good agent systems, and nonlinear control theory with applications to robotics, cyber physical systems, and natural social networks. In particular, she has focused on the modeling and control of robot sensor networks, the development of distributed coordination algorithms for groups of autonomous vehicles, and the geometric control for mechanical systems. For her work on the control of the actuator mechanical system, she received the Best Student Paper Award at uh, IEEE Conference on Decision and Control in 2002. Uh, she was the recipient, recipient of NSF Air Career Award in 2007, and for the co-authored papers, Motion Coordination with Distributed Information and Soil on Dynamic Average Consensus, the problem its applications and the algorithm. She received it respectfully to, in 2018 and 2021, the Control Systems Magazine Outstanding Paper Award. She was named the ITFOE Fellow Class of 2018 for her work on geometric mechanics and new agent systems. She's a senior editor of Automatica and the editor in chief of the publication ITFOE Open Journal of Control Systems. So, Professor Martinez, it's a pleasure to give you the word, and I hope you we we, we enjoy the presentation. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the pleasure is mine. It's a great honor to participate in this uh, online seminar, and thank you everyone for your time and attending the seminar. I hope you like it. So uh, for my presentation today, I want to just make some connections and applications talk about applications of optimal transport and sets of probability distributions for the coordination of swarms. And so um, let me go over a high level into this. Um, a swarm for me is a multi-agent system. It's a complex system composed of many parts. Uh, these uh, parts interact with each other. And as a consequence, you can observe some uh, emerging patterns, uh, self-organization. Sometimes uh, these patterns are due to some uh, decision making, decision making at the agent level, le uh, level. Uh, but always these agents have a partial view of the world. Still, they can solve many many problems. Uh, some examples are uh, classical physical examples, like many particle systems. Uh, the epitome of a uh, you know example is uh, swarms in biology, like the ones you see in the pictures. You can also consider other systems like populations or social dynamics to be 
a sophisticated uh, multi-agent system, if you like. Um, but well, because they are very versatile, uh, this has led to many applications in engineering, in particular the one uh, we'll talk about here is that of uh, groups of robots that you try to coordinate, uh, but it could be other types of uh, systems with applications in manufacturing or transportation. Um, these swarms are coordinated by means of um, solving basic problems like reaching a consensus or achieving some motion synchronization. This can be used to solve other uh, problems like uh, assigning tasks of managing resources by means of distributed optimization and learning algorithms. And we have a variety of algorithms today. Now, um, still these solutions we have are challenged by various problems, like for example, larger scales, right? So. Many times still these algorithms are inefficient as the number of agent, agents increases, uh, they are uh, slow. Um, it's also true that because you know, when you work with a very large systems, uh, there is lots of uncertainty because it's impossible to know every, you know, the status of every member in the group, if you like. Uh, and this uncertainty opens the way to uh, vulnerability. So there is more opportunity for failures, more opportunity for intentional attacks and everything, right? So, um, so then more than ever today, uh, we need um, to understand the fundamentals with mathematical tools that can help us uh, do this and also uh, solve these problems in a rigorous way. And so today I'm gonna well talk a little bit about this, uh, just uh, showing you some ideas through this common lens of uh, coverage control, uh, which is a classical problem in the coordination of robots. So here the main goal is the following: you have a density in a certain environment, say a compact uh, set. Uh, that defines a measure of probability over the set and encodes somehow a global task, right? So this is gonna um, represent areas in the space that are more important with, where you have a higher generation of tasks, if you like, right? And so here then the goal is to uh, define, find an algorithm that drives the agents, the robot positions to the best locations to service these tasks as characterized by the density. Now, uh, what you would like to do is to uh, have an algorithm that has the following properties. So we want robustness. And so uh, this robustness, for example, is uh, realized by having every agent do their compu computations locally, right? So be able to arrive at the solution, maybe interacting with others. Uh, with communication and sensing, uh, you know, limitations, but they can do this. And also robustness from the point of view that if you um, remove one agent from the group, one robot, then the solution is not going to change dramatically. You will have a good uh, task assignment, if you like. Now, um, what is the typical approach to do this? We typically, we use a top-down approach. We identify a, an optimization problem, some performance metric, and then thanks to this, we are able to say, okay, uh, we finally achieved this task. Now, what uh, optimization and one performance, what performance metric depends on the assumptions of your problem, right? And for example, here you could have a swarm that is a small, so it's composed of a finite number of agents, or it could be really a very large infinite swarm there could be uncertainty or not in the in the system, right? And so anyway, so those ingredients are gonna change your problem a little bit. There are of course relationships between these two that I'm gonna try to speak about. Um, and then uh, what is common to uh, the settings somehow underlying is the fact that we can, you know, they use Wasserstein metrics um, can be understand, understood with you know, as something happening in a Wasserstein space, if you like. Uh, and so that's the connection through all of these, these questions. Um, I'm gonna 
describe uh, three types of solutions, right, with various assumptions. The last problem talks about uncertainty, so it's a bit different, but anyway, the, the connection is given based with these Wasserstein and probability uh, measures. Okay, so I'm gonna start talking about what is a multi-scale deployment, right? And to, to talk about multiple scales, uh, well, we need to give a description of the swarm. For example, we can talk about topic configurations, right? Which are given by just uh, agent positions in a certain uh, domain, right? That you could think these are of identical agents. Or alternatively, if your swarm is very, very large, then you would have a density of agents. Uh, typically, this is gonna give you an absolutely continuous measure, right? But then there is a relationship between these two. You could understood the first uh, microscopic configurations to define an empirical measure that is going to approach the uh, macroscopic measure as the number of agents goes to infinity, so, sort of based on a uh, law of large numbers, uh, if you like, right? So this is a uh, yeah, first connection. And then uh, a multi-scale approach to coordination would be one that ideally allow us to go from, you know, between different scales. So you can take limits, for example, and you can go to the large scale or you can discretize, go to the uh, micro scale uh, uh, domain, right? And there is a you know nice relationship between these two that makes the whole thing consistent. And so why we would like to do this is because, well, this way we can capture features of the problem in a consistent manner and take advantage of what is available at each level. So for example, at the macro scale, uh, when we consider very large swarms, right? So this is sort of a relaxation. We don't have to worry about details at every agent. Many parameters, you know, can be abstracted away, average out if you like. Um, we have nice uh, equations and then we have classical tools that we can use for algorithm design and algorithm analysis, which is great. Now, however, uh, then we have to work with uh, algorithms that are implementable in the micro scale uh, for a finite number of agents, right? And so well, we have to ensure that the properties that we obtain at the high level, at the large scale, you know, really translate well and account for the constraints that these agents have. Like I'm, I'm talking about implementations have to be discrete, uh, you need to account for local sensing communication constraints and these type of things, right? Uh, so ideally, what we would like is to keep a view of both worlds. Also, the macro scale help us, you know, capture large scale effects, which is important, right? And so, um, yeah, so ideally, this multi scale approach would be one that tries to conciliate these two views, right, in a, in a consistent way. And so, Let's talk about how to do this with just the deployment, right? So here the goal is that you have um, you have an initial density, right, of agents, and this is a macro scale at the macro scale level, and you wanna shape it into some target density roster, right? And um, well, how would you do this? Classically, you can imagine well, my agents are really simple; I can control them. Uh, really well, so maybe you know I can just control them by specifying a velocity control field, right? Giving well, the, what's the velocity of every agent at a given position, right? But then I have to make sure uh, this velocity control field is locally computable by agents, so meaning they don't require global information about the problem to do this. Uh, we want to ensure some conservation of agents, right? So. This means that a few agents, you know, maybe can fail, but, you know, it's not really a significant amount that can fail. And uh, finally, we want to guarantee uh, we are approaching the goal in, in some way, right? So with some sort of metric, we can evaluate this. Okay, so that would be simple enough, right? Now, what is a, a, an approach that we can use for this? Well, 
have this metric and this certainly suggests, well, this is a Lyapunov function I have to find, right? And um, I can take as a Lyapunov function, well, various options. I could define a functional, uh, two arguments. One of the arguments is fixed at the goal density, right? Or at, at the goal measure. And then I can try to, you know, find a control algorithm that makes this decrease uh, use some Lyapunov result. And so there are many options that you can think of Lyapunov function. For example, you can take a standard L2 distance when this is well defined, uh, absolutely. I could consider other type of uh, pseudo metrics, like for example, divergence, like KL divergence. This is also gonna be, you know, have good properties. It's gonna be zero at the target density. Uh, or I could certainly consider uh, Wasserstein, uh, a Wasserstein metric, which is a metric in the space of uh, probabilities with bounded moments. And then these are two versions of describing this metric. Uh, Intuit, what these metrics represent is the following, and this is um, describing this picture on the right. You know? So, um, so the Wasserstein metric from one measure to another is the, you know, captures the cost of transporting mass uh, distributed according to the density given by the first measure into the density given by the second measure when these are absolutely continuous, right? And so uh, that cost can be expressed in, a, in this way. This is um, the Kantorovich version of the metric, this is uh, related to optimal transport, but basically, uh, you know, captures this cost of mo uh, moving these masses, uh, minimizing, uh, you know, the, the cost of transport. Okay, so this is a, this is a metric, and we could also use this. Take one of you know the target measure to be the, the target one, and uh, and then try to minimize this. And um, all right, so taking this. Now one can define a gradient flow, and this is something that uh, you know different people have looked into. Uh, you could say, well, my velocity ve vector field, I can take it to be minus the gradient of the first variation of this functional, where this functional could be any of these uh, that I mentioned before. You could even consider more, and you could you know obtain different expressions for this uh, gradient equation. But something that is not hard to do is, uh, well, take a, any of these three and you can show, you know, okay, the solutions of this gradient flow exist and with this boundary condition, you can use a, a standard, you know, generalized LaSalle invariance principle here and show that you have convergence to the target uh, density almost everywhere. And so it is. It is a nice result, and this is a result that is uh, being known already. Okay, now comes the question of, okay, I want to obtain versions that are implementable for these swarms, right? So then um, I need some requirements. For example, I want to make sure that when I compute this velocity vector field, right, this is going to lead to something that only is local. It, you know, agents can use distributed communication and sensing in order to come up with their own velocities. Um, we also want a version of the equations that is discrete. And this means discrete in time and discrete in space. Uh, so they can implement it. Uh, and then when I do implement this over robots, I will have to face other issues. Okay, so like for example, Agents, robots typically operate asynchronously. Maybe there are delays, right? So, so there are all of these issues that now you have to account for. Now, uh, we, we are gonna mainly talk about the, the second bullet point here. And so what, what we want is, well, we have some equations in a continuous time and a distribution space, right? And we want to be able to transfer this over here, discrete time and agent positions. This is what I want to do. Okay, so classically, how would you do this? So something you can do is discretize using first order differences, these equations, and then you have discrete versions. Uh, now there is some, some caution uh, has to be accepted with this. 
because typically the discretizations are conservative. Uh, moreover, they, they could be they could require time varying step sizes in time and space, you know, space wise as well. So uh, that's uh, uh, not great because usually those um, sequences of, of step sizes they require global information so that you you have you can ensure convergence and everything. So it's typically conservative and not awesome. So uh, one could look into alternative approaches that uh, basically uh, build on some recent ideas from optimization. Uh, the idea is to you know, uh, look into optimization problems that are sort of trying to do what you are trying to do with the gradient flow, right? Uh, but derive them uh, directly in discrete time, okay? And then go from this discrete time to the space, uh, the agent position space, okay? And so here uh, we want to avoid also first order differences. So we can do that through sampling, okay? And that, that's exactly the approach I'm gonna describe here. We are gonna go from this box to this other box. Um, and in the in these steps, you will see that I will identify optimization problems that are kind of consistent with each other. And well, basically you could go, you know, by sampling or taking limits from, you know, uh, between these problems. So that's, uh, that's the idea. So we want to maintain this consistency. All right, so then uh, the first step then is go from continuous time to discrete time. Uh, what we want to do is to construct this sequence of densities from row one to row star uh, by means of some uh, algorithm, right? And so the next algorithm that is uh, the closest to gradient would be this proximal gradient uh, scheme. And so uh, I'm not sure if you are familiar with this, but basically, right, so uh, you solve uh, an optimization problem, right, at every iteration time. The optimization is given by this functional, right? So over here, you have the square to Wasserstein distance, right? Which measures distance between your current iteration and the next one you want to go to. And here, this is a functional that you pick. This is a form of proximal gradient scheme. The advantage with respect to a uh, gradient uh, algorithm is that if it works, then you can choose the step size to be constant. You don't have a, you don't need a time varying step, step size. And so, I mean, what are the assumptions that you can uh, you can uh, look for that ensures this? And what is the functional that we are gonna choose? So here, this G is gonna be actually one of the candidate functionals that I put in the previous slide. So could be L2, could be Wasserstein, uh, and so on, okay? One of these. It has to have some convexity properties in some sense. Um, it has to be nice. It has to be Frechette differentiable. It has to be L-smooth. And L-smooth here is similar when the when the functional, the, when in terms of functions, when these are differentiable, it means the Hessians are bounded, okay? So it's, it's nice, okay? So if it has all of these nice properties, and in addition has the minimizer in the target measure, right? Then this is gonna work. It's gonna, you know, progressively take my initial density to the target density through little steps, and the steps are quantified by this tau. Okay. Uh, and in principle, with these properties, well, we should be able to solve this infinite dimensional optimization problem. And so uh, a key result is that all of the previous Fs that we identified before satisfy these or sufficient variations that allow us to say that um, when you you know when when you are able to obtain a sequence of measures by that satisfies this scheme and these are absolutely continuous, we have um, convergence to the target density, right? Um, and this is also using a type of um, LaSalle type of result. And convergence here means convergence in the sense of the W2 distance. So that's the weak convergence that we have. 
Okay, so this is great. It's the first step is a discretization in time. Now, this is not good enough. We want to go to, um, you know, uh, samples in space, right? So, uh, so we so we look into this, right? So you can do this interpreting that, okay, the sequence of densities, right? They generate, you can say they are distributions and they are gonna generate samples, right? And the samples are positions, right? So uh, by means of the following scheme, I can see that, okay, the samples generated from row one will get to the samples generated by row star. Okay, this is this is great. Now, can I express this algorithm using those stochastic samples? And the answer is yes, you can actually do that. Um, the resulting scheme in the samples can be expressed also as a sort of a proximal gradient uh, recursion. Here, what happened is that I replaced the square two distance, Wasserstein distance by just the standard a square two norm, okay, distance. And here I have to uh, pick a right sequence of functions phi k, okay? So uh, what I can tell you is that if you pick this phi k to be the first variation of the functional evaluated at the next step of the uh, measure, right? The mu k plus one. And if I take a sufficiently small uh, tau, then this scheme is exactly equivalent to the previous scheme, but in terms, now it's expressed in terms of samples, okay? So it, we capture this. Now, this is great, great this is better, but uh, it has one problem. We express, you know, uh, derivatives or, or these functions in terms implicitly, right? It requires me to know what is the next density measure that I'm gonna go to, and that's not uh, not great because this will give me an implicit equation. And so you can say, well, can I try, can I actually try to use uh, the current measure? And the answer is yes, you can do it. You have, you know, this scheme now, where now this is a different function, but under sufficient, you know, regularity assumptions, still you can show that this scheme is gonna work in the sense that it will take you to the target density you wanted. Now, the thing is that you lose the equivalence with the macroscopic uh, scheme, if you like, okay? So, so still the answer is positive. You still need to ask more regularity on the functional part. Okay, so that sounds good. Now, uh, this is great. So we made this transition this, you know, in principle could give rise to local computations, but I want to see that more uh, clearly. And also we would like to have a scheme that really does not depend on measures. It depends on positions which, because, you know, that, that would be the uh, a completely, you know, a closed form expression, you know, on agent positions that would be the really more uh, amenable to microscopic implementations. So let's do that. And we can do that by means of this variational approach that uh, tries to look at the problem uh, consistently. So in other words, we identify a problem with a micro scale that is an optimization problem and that is consistent somehow with a macroscopic problem, right? And so to do this, what we can do is say, okay, I take the functional that I started from and I'm gonna come up with a discretization of the functional and then look at the corresponding scheme in the microscopic uh, uh, level, right? So how do I do this discretization? So here is how I, I do it. So I take the functional and I evaluate it in something that looks like a discrete measure, okay? So this is not exactly uh, the empirical measure of the samples because uh, that is going, not, not to be very nice, you know, regarding properties of differentiability that I want. Uh, instead, what we do is we take a smooth out empirical. So if you like, you put a Gaussian on top of each sample, you center, you know, a Gaussian there and you have a little variation um, um, given by this H constant. Okay, so this is like the variance of these Gaussians and then you sum them up and it gives you a smooth out version of the empirical. 
uh, and that's what I use to define this uh, discrete, discrete version of the functional, okay? And now I can say, well, all right, my analog the analogous problem uh, would be this multi-agent proximal uh, algorithm. And now I have replaced my, you know, uh, functions phi k that I had by directly by this functional over here, where I keep, you know, for every agent, every agent has a position xi. Uh, what we do over here is every agent fixes the positions of other agents, and it just optimizes this cost function in C. And that will, that is what gives the agent next position. All right, so if you are um, well familiar with multi-agent coordination algorithms, you see this, and also with game theory, actually, this looks like a best response dynamics. And uh, it is, right? So I do what is best for me, thinking that others are not gonna change uh, what their positions are. This is best response. So um, in addition, okay, we went from something that was convex in principle you can solve to a problem now that we don't know, you know, what, what is these properties of this guy. And in indeed, what happens is that you lose uh, convexity properties by applying this discretization. So, but uh, fortunately, because of the uh, good properties of the functional, uh, you can still uh, say, you know, this is cell smooth, and then you can uh, take the tau to be sufficiently small so that the whole functional, I mean, the whole function now is a strongly convex. So in principle, you can, you know, you can solve these problems. There is uh, one solution and so on. So this is something uh, nice thanks to the functional properties that we had. And then uh, regarding convergence, uh, you still need to take, I mean, you, you need to take even your uh, uh, step size to be smaller by some constants, okay? And assuming that um, this function is differentiable and the critical points are inside the domain, then actually the algo this algorithm is gonna converge to a critical point uh, which is not a local uh, maximizer. And, and it could be a saddle point actually in connection with, with best response dynamics. But anyway, so uh, that's the, the result we get, which is nice. So we made the, the whole transition from macro scales to micro scales this way. And now I would like to connect with other problems that we have studied in cooperative control for a while, which are these coverage control problems. And um, Okay, so, so here is the problem. It's a different version, but uh, you have an environment, you want to, you have still have this target density and you want to control these robot positions to service this task by means of some first order uh, integrator dynamics, which is kind of analogous to the uh, dynamics that we have considered so far. So the way this problem is solved in the has been solved in the literature is by oh, yes identifying a optimization problem. We need to find a good performance metric and then design the controls that optimize this function. And so uh, this is a function that is called expected value distortion metric. More, possibly you are familiar with it, yeah. And uh, it basically uh, captures, um, intuitively captures what is the, you know, average distance from any position, from any robot position to any point in the environment. So this is average is given by this integral, right? Here is the average is taken with respect to this target density. And this is what represents kind of the distance from the set of points to any other point in the environment. And it's given like this. This F over here is captures for sensor networks. It's like a sensor degradation function and it's a non-decreasing uh, function, okay? So basically, if we minimize this H, we will have a good coverage, right? And you can see here what is the, you know, good coverage uh, looks like, okay? So this is a nice, configuration agents are located at the high importance uh, portions of the space. 
Now, uh, there are algorithms to solve this, and those are the algorithms uh, that I'm referring to. So they use Voronoi partitions, which are partitions of the space, as illustrated here. They simplify this inner minimization. And then uh, one, I mean, there is this Lloyd algorithm that consists of computing first the partition, then agents move, calculate something that is called the center of mass of the region. They move there and they iterate between partition computation, motion to center of mass, and so on, right? And eventually uh, you have convergence to a local uh, minimizer, right? That looks like this. Okay, so this is the you know algorithm that's been studied in the literature. And now what is the connection of this with the algorithms that I just came up with? So first of all, one can make a connection with optimal transport. Okay, so one can interpret this in terms of optimal transport. Uh, basically, uh, the optimal, the cost of transport from a robot position to another position in the environment can be defined like this. So basically, use our function, sensing function. This is Euclidean distance. Okay, so that could play the role of unit cost of transport. Now we can also uh, define uh, special uh, metrics, uh, measures in the space, right? So to do this, uh, to consider a partition of the environment, right? Every uh, region in the partition has a certain mass, which is the integral of the rho star over the region, right? Um, and so there you have, you know, partitions and masses. And the Voronoi partition is actually defined in this way. This is a partition and is the one in the picture. Okay, now with these partitions, you can define uh, what is called a discrete measure, which is basically is a sum of empirical distribution uh, delta functions at every position. And what this does is it concentrates the mass of the region Wi, which is little wi, on top of the point xi. Okay, so you have, you know, you go from partitions and masses to these discrete measures. Okay. Well, it turns out that something that, you know, I figured out after <laughs> looking into this problem, but it's actually it was known, okay, is that this empirical uh, metric that we were uh, using all the time actually is, can be understood as an optimal transport is the best uh, optimal, this is optimal transport in the most sense, but it is the, the best optimal transport from this type of empirical measures or discrete measures to the target density uh, rho star, okay? So, and the best one, the, the, the measure that gives you the best is actually the one defined by the Voronoi partition, which is over here, okay? So all the time, okay, this is what really this metric uh, means, okay? Now, what happens if you look at the large scale situation for this uh, metric, which is a question we have. So we, we said that, okay, you know, if we take n number of agents going to infinity, so what we will have if we do that, we will have the, you know, best thing possible. And the answer is yes, actually, because when you take n going to infinity because of this definition over here, how the Voronoi partitions come in, we actually have for free, without having to do anything, uh, we will achieve a zero value of the cost because we will have convergence of the discrete measure to the true density. So, you know, this problem that we were looking at for a while is not meaningful at the large scale actually. So, in fact, what makes sense at the large scale is to consider a variation of this metric which is given by this is the same function as before, even though we have a sum here, but instead of using a standard Voronoi partitions, you have to use what are called a multiplicatively weighted partition uh, that look like this and that have equal mass. So every agent has the same mass in its region. And so if you do this, uh, the corresponding metric with this constraint will give you this uh, expression for optimal transport. And when you take the large scale limit, this is a, you know, it's exactly the optimal transport from 
the original density to the target density. So this is one of the metrics that uh, we were considering in the, in the first part of the talk precisely. Okay, this one is the one that captures the discrepancy and is the one actually we should have considered from the start when we looked at these mobile sensor problems in the large scale. And then, okay, so uh, our class of algorithms actually belongs, can be seen as a type of algorithm at the micro scale that optimizes this cost function. And so we kind of rediscover, okay, these are the algorithms that were already available uh, in the literature that we are uh, recovering, right? Which use, you know, uh, this metric and then in order to make them distributed somehow and amenable, you know, to distributed implementations, you have to use these generalized Voronoi partitions and make sure that you have equal masses and so on. And well, basically it requires a little, you know, additional subroutine over here, but it's an algorithm <laughs> existing in the literature. And that's nice connection to, you know, close this cycle. Um, because of, you know, the, the algorithm properties and also, I mean, we could discuss more about this, but uh, because of the discrete time character, um, and also the nice properties of, you know, optimal transport and, and this problem, you can actually see, right, this algorithm uh, is distributed in a certain sense, according, you know, it's something that can be defined according to these generalized Voronoi partitions, which define a graph, it's a Delano graph, and uh, that's distributed over this graph. And it also has a very good asynchronous property. So it's really robust to asynchronous as well. This is uh, another version of our algorithm, right? Uh, without using the partitions and you see, okay, for a discrete number of agents, how we, you know, if we have more agents, actually we do much better in covering distributions that are multimodal. Here is for 50, this is for 100. I mean, the, the result is clearly better for larger, right? Anyway, so that's that. Um, now let's go to the next part of the, of the talk, right? So we talked about, okay, we want to reach to this target density, right? We mentioned optimal transport, but okay, now that we said to, we are talking about that, how about if we transfer the whole mass optimally according to optimal transport as well, okay? Not just you know, we just, we just don't want to reach that final distribution, but also transfer optimally. So um, that's something we looked at and we have a very limited answer for, uh, for a very special case. <laughs> okay, so, and the, the main constraint here is uh, the dis, you know, having distributed computations basically, okay? So this is the idea. So we have a discrete uh, iteration in densities how about we want to, you know, we want to transport them optimally to the goal. So, and we want to have an algorithm in the samples. So looking into options here, there are, you know, uh, two, one can talk about Markov chain Monte Carlo. Those are algorithms that are, you know, uh, algorithms in samples, they are nice, they are decentralized, but typically not optimal. Uh, but we can then say, okay, how about we use optimal transport? Certainly, this is going to be optimal, but uh, unfortunately, uh, if we use optimal transport metric, uh, that computation of optimal transport is, in principle, centralized. Okay, so that's a big uh, limitation here for this. So, what did we do? So, what we did is well, what kind of followed an online approach. Uh, and try to approximate these optimal transport mappings progressively as we have agents move through these stages. Okay, so um, so it's basically we break down the transport in stages, and then we have agents in each state, each stage. Uh, sorry, try to approximate the optimal transport mapping. Okay, that's the idea. And uh, we do that for a very special uh, situation and based on two uh, main steps. The first step is, well, this problem is, you know, um, if we have global information, we will know how to solve it. Uh, we will have this optimal transport. Imagine the, you know, 
this is some optimal transport cost. And because of, you know, uh, principle of optimality, we can break, you know, we can transport in one whole uh, go, or we can break it down in, in pieces, right? And by principle of optimality, we have, you know, this property, you know, this additivity property that it holds. And so we are gonna uh, take advantage of that to define a first update in samples in positions of agents. Uh, this algorithm over here looks very much like the previous ones. Now we are using some cost C here, and here we have some sequence of functions. In our case, the sequence of functions are going to be related to the optimal transport. These are called Kantorovich potentials, okay? And so basically, they, they tell you how to move optimally from one location until, until the goal. But uh, something we are going to do is, the, is this, right? So we are going to restrict the motions of the particles to be close to each other. So by restricting them to be in a certain ball, right? Um, but other than that, we are going to take randomly any solution to this problem. And I have to say that the number of solutions to this problem is going to be infinite because, you know, uh, this is giving you the optimal transport. So basically any point in this geodesic, you know, that is close to me uh, is a solution to this problem. So there are many solutions. So we just pick one and ra at random here, and that's the algorithm we have. If you, uh, you know, uh, look at this algorithm in the, in the measure uh, version of it, right? So we have that the measures are going to satisfy the optimality equation, right? So it's going to give me an optimal sequence that are, you know, uh, giving me very close by measures, but also because of this random, randomness step, we can guarantee convergence to the target measure. So this is making progress to, toward the target. So that would be the high level part of this algorithm. Now, what do we do uh, for the computation of this fees? Because that's the thing that is the bottleneck here to make things distributed. So uh, that's where we need a very particular form of, of the problem. Uh, the type of costs that we can handle are essentially metric uh, costs. Is a, I mean, we say it's a Riemannian metric, it's conformal to the Euclidean distance, but you can think, okay, it's just Euclidean distance. If, um, if that's the case, we can exploit a dual problem formulation of optimal transport, which uses these so-called Kantorovich potentials, okay? And this formulation of the problem can be equivalent, you know, it's captured, the solution of this problem is captured by, by this other problem, where uh, the important thing here is that we have, uh, we can show um, the Kantorovich potential here is differentiable almost everywhere. And because of this conformal property, we have a bound by this conformal factor, okay? So this is, um, you know, the key for us to be able to come up with a problem that we can solve in a distributed way, okay? And so this is how we do it. So in the similar, you know, spirit as before, we come up with a problem that is a discrete version of this problem, okay? So how do we define it? So we define it in this way. So my Kantorovich potentials, right, are approximated by a simple interpolation over a Voronoi partition, one per agent. So every agent, you know, has no, can have knowledge of these values, constant values phi i, right? And then uh, we transform this objective into this sum because of the interpolation. So this is, you know, reduces to a sum. And uh, this, instead of, you know, the, the version that we take is a, you know, first order difference version and use C over here um, to, to handle the constraint. Okay, so now this problem is a problem that, for which there are distributed algorithms that agents can use in order to come up with a solution to the problem. So every agent can use what is called the primal dual algorithm, okay? Uh, interact with each other over a communication graph, exchanging these variables, and they can come up with a value for their own phi i, 
and they can know also the values of the neighbor's uh, FIIs, okay? So that's the approximation that is used. And that's how we put tie everything together, okay? The summary is the following. We have these stages, we wanna reach this target measure. And so we combine two uh, loops. There are outer iterations, which are realizing the big uh, step transports, right? This is based on the first part. And the inner iterations are the ones that, you know, agents use to approximate the Kantorovich mapping, okay? Which is basically implementing this primal dual algorithm. Uh, every agent, you know, has to run this internal iteration for a while, obtain these fee values, right? Once they have these fee values, they can say, oh, this is my approximation of the Kantorovich potential, right? It's a simple in interpolation. And that's basically what I have to use over here, right? I use over here and then I can calculate my next position. All right, so that's approximate, I mean, that's the story. Uh, this is some illustration of how this works uh, for a simple Gaussian and a number of agents. And essentially we evaluate, well, I mean, how the inner iterations affect the cost of transport. As you can imagine, the more iterations you have per uh, stage, the better, the closer we, we are to optimal transport. And this is shown here. And in this graph on the left, you see how, well, the impact of inner iterations on the uh, tasks that are assigned to agents, which is basically given by the mass of the regions they have as they move. And the, you know, variance here of those uh, regions, right? The masses are not very large, so which is kind of good, but anyway. So this is another uh, demonstration of the algorithm for a more interesting, interesting multimodal Gaussian. And so uh, with just one internal iteration, but if you have large number of agents, you end up well at the final configuration. And I don't have here a picture for the cost of transport, but okay, it's reasonable. I mean, it could be better if you have more iterations, but it's not uh, bad. And that's, that's, uh, that's it. Okay, so with this, I finished my first part, and then I wanted to talk about uncertainty. It's gonna be a bit of a change with respect to this multi-scale approach, okay? Um, I'm just gonna focus on the problem, you know, original problem we all considered, which is wrong in the large scales, but okay. So, but assuming or thinking about what if there are uncertainty, what is there is uncertainty in this problem? Uh, how do we handle it? And how do Wasserstein comes up here? So, uh, and the, the way, in, you know, in which you can consider uh, uncertainty, the simplest way is, well, what if my target density is unknown? I mean, and of course there are other ways of considering uncertainty, but this is, I guess, the most basic. What can we do? So, um, well, it turns out that this problem is an expectation with respect to this density. And if we don't know, I mean, what we are trying to do by solving it is basically addressing this a stochastic optimization function, okay? But the thing is that now we don't know the distribution of the uncertainty, right? So what can we do? What we can do is the following. So if we assume that agents are able to take measures of this density, right? Of certain realizations of this density, then what we can do is say, well, we can solve a sample average approximation version. Um, we take an empirical distribution and then solve the version with the samples, which is gonna be a sum. And so certainly this, is the, this, is, this can be done, this is the case, but as you may know, these solutions are typically optimistic with respect to the true problem. Uh, so uh, the reason is that, well, I mean, you need a very large number of samples uh, to have a good approximation to the problem through the empirical. And you don't know how well you are doing with a finite number. And many times this is results in an optimistic solution. So instead, what we can do is we can consider a problem in a robust version, but in a distributional sense. And uh, instead, minimize the worst case expectation where uh, given by Q, Q is in an ambiguity set, okay? 
So, um, so what is this ambiguity set? So this is a set of probability distributions containing the true one with high confidence. And um, there are many ways of selecting them uh, using like these ideas, these different functionals, if you like, right? Could give you one. And in particular, when you use Wasserstein metrics, you have a very good type of ambiguity sets. And uh, Wasserstein just provides a metric. It gives you a topology, and then you can define a ball in the standard topological sense, right? Over here, the center of this ball can be the empirical distribution. The radius is something that depends on the number of samples and the confidence you want to have. So in the following sense, it's been shown that uh, when you consider Wasserstein and you pick the radius in an appropriate way, uh, you can guarantee with high confidence, with high probability, that the true distribution is in the ambiguity set uh, and the confidence is given by this one minus beta. So what, what you have to do is pick this radius in a way that, okay, so when you have a, a small number of samples, the radius has to be very large to have this guarantee. But if you have a large number of samples, then this ball can be taken to be smaller and you still have the same guarantees. So this is a type of a concentration result, which basically quantifies what's the convergence, you know, to the empirical, to the true distribution somehow, okay? So, but uh, what was nice is that uh, Spahani and Kuhn were able to use this type of ambiguities to uh, solve problems and uh, in a non, you know, in a robust way in the following sense. So uh, suppose you use, you know, you, you somehow find a solution to this uh, previous problem by looking into this uh, ambiguity ball and you have a solution J hat X hat, the cost hat and the decision, right? So then uh, this is uh, robust in the following sense. If you were to use that decision in the true problem, and you calculated the expectation of that, then the probability that the cost you get is larger than the calculated cost that you obtain through just a few samples, this is gonna be very small. So it means that, uh, you know, with high confidence, the calculated value with a few samples is gonna be very close to the optimal value if you were to know the true distribution. And so uh, Espahani and Kuhn, uh, you know, go further and look into conditions that allows you to uh, solve this problem because this is an infinite dimensional problem. So make it a tractable, finite dimensional problem. And then they require, uh, well, okay, several conditions on the cost, which are sort of restrictive, especially if we want to apply it to our deployment coverage problem, right? So. Instead, what we were doing is we were looking into approximations of these Wasserstein, Wasserstein ambiguity sets. Um, so uh, basically it's a problem reduction and we wanted the sets to contain densities, uh, absolutely continuous measures. Uh, we want it to be data-driven and be, you know, be tuned as small as desired in the spirit of this previous result. Um, that also we want to it co to contain uh, the true distribution with a high probability, and also as well that it could incorporate prior knowledge about the density, and this is especially useful uh, for the performance of the optimization. And so what we did is well we explored different options and we built on previous results and we consider. Um, parametrizations of these balls by means of hard wavelet basis, uh, which is a classical uh, classical basis of functions. Uh, this is an orthonormal basis of a square integrable functions. You consider, you know, for simplicity, you can imagine your costs and functions are defined over a unit or, or a certain cube, right? And then those wavelets are constructed by means of uh, indicator functions, and these are the giving you a scaling functions. And then this other size, which are basically obtained by cutting this indicator, flipping half down, 
right? And then combining products of this, you have the different elements of the bases. Um, these five products are across different dimensions. This gives you the scaling functions. And when you involve in the product uh, side, then you have wavelets. And this is like examples of how, how this looks like in two dimensions. And uh, you can, I mean, and, and of course you can imagine that you, you can approximate a square integral functions like this, you know, by considering these different fleet versions of cubes uh, that complement each other and also by considering different scale versions to refine uh, the resolutions of these uh, uh, functions. And so that's basically what this picture represents, right? And uh, then we have uh, these nice bases, right? That, you know, uh, give us approximations of integrable functions uh, for, um, you know, that are constant up to a certain resolution, right? We have different uh, subsets. Um, and these are, these are, this is essentially what we work with. Um, now we define a, approximations of ambiguities using that are projected into these spaces uh, that are constant functions up to resolution minus j. And uh, this is what we do. So in place of the empirical distribution, we take this wavelet empirical density, right? Which basically uh, call calculates the coefficients of the wavelet according to the number of samples that fall into the domain of each function. So for example, for a scaling function, uh, you count how many samples fall into the uh, domain where it is positive. For the wavelets, you have to uh, count number of uh, samples where the wavelet is positive minus number of samples where it is negative, right? And that gives you the coefficients that have these, these expressions and that would play the role of the empirical distribution. And I mean, this is nothing else than a type of a histogram approximation of a signal, right? But it is special in the way it's uh, constructed uh, as compared with other histogram approximations. So what is nice about this is that um, with the scaling functions, you can capture the larger uh, signal variations, if you like, and with the wavelets, you can capture the you know higher order uh, frequency variations, right? And and then you have this, you know, th this is how coefficients compare, you know, in one basis with respect to another, right? And it's nice that you know we have these approximations with just the first elements of the um, wavelets. Right, so now this is these are conditions on how to define these ambiguity sets, right? So instead, you know, I mean, we translate this Wasserstein distance in, into distance between the the coefficients for a projection of the of the density into this uh, um, constant resolution set, right? And so that would be, you know, the conditions now you have to ask for. Uh, for a projection of the density to be in the ambiguity set, right? So, so these are the parameters of any projection of any density, and they have to be close to the empirical distributions, but also satisfy certain additional constraints that ensure we do have a density, uh, the density is, is non-negative, and also accounts for prior upper and lower bounds. So, it's some, you know, distance constraints, but also some other constraints as described here. Um, now, uh, what it can be shown is that um, you can tune, you know, you can say now, all right, uh, now we define the ambiguity set by choosing how far uh, those coefficients have to be from the, from the empiricals one and you can tune those epsilon depending on the number of samples that you get in the same way as with Wasserstein, which is nice. And so then what we can do is we can guarantee that uh, given a true density, if we project it to this constant, uh, to this resolution uh, space of constant up to uh, resolution J, then uh, we can guarantee that this projection is uh, 
close to the uh, empirical distribution with high confidence uh, if we choose those epsilon like this. Well, in a certain way that depends on the number of samples. And so in addition, together with this, right, we can also um, guarantee, we can also evaluate how far the true distribution is from its projection to this constant resolution uh, set. And that's, you know, depends on the resolution for sure. So now these two results can be used to reduce our coverage control problem uh, to something that is just parameterized by the ambiguity set uh, and gives you, you know, something that looks like this. So to cut a long story short, okay, so we go from a coverage-like problem to something that looks like this, where now we have parameters that we have to maximize and then we have the positions to minimize here and solving this problem would give you something that approximates with high confidence the original problem we wanted to solve so we are not being uh, uh, over optimistic uh, this way um, how we do it i'm not going to go into the details right now you would have to come up with an algorithm that is distributed and everything we have a, an algorithm that is centralized right now and is basically uh, it's trying to approximate gradients of the function, right? So here we have an inner maximization. Uh, in principle, we don't know the functions of the values of this function, so we have to approximate somehow its generalized uh, gradient, and we do this by samples, basically. And this is what this theorem is about. Uh, tries to estimate these generalized gradients of this function uh, by something that is called the Clark epsilon subdifferential, uh, which is a little bit large, a set that is a little bit larger than the standard uh, Clark uh, subdifferential. And we, you know, adjust this by means of some Armijo line search and everything, and we have some guarantees of convergence. But let me not go into the details of this. Uh, we are also working on a algorithm decentralization, and I think we can we can do this. Now, this is uh, an implementation of uh, the algorithm just to show you how how it works. And um, but basically, we have these initial configurations. We have the uh, density is just constant is given by these two blocks. And we have some upper and lower bound to these values. And with this information, I mean, there is a big overlap. This information, if you implement this algorithm uh, that I outlined, eventually you get agents to go to the right location of these boxes where the density is, So, uh, which is nice. And we also have comparisons with what would be the uh, sample average approximation version of this algorithm. And this performs much, be much better. Uh, okay, so that's it. That's all I wanted to tell you about. I think I covered a, a lot of different topics. What I wanted to show is, okay, there are these coverage problems. There are uh, different assumptions on how to look at them. Uh, you know, it depends on what the assumptions you have are. Uh, we are interested in the question of large scales and uncertainty and well, surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly, the tools that uh, come up are, well, uh, distances in probability spaces uh, play a significant role here. And uh, yeah, we, we are uh, very happy to see this. And we also, of course, there are connections with other algorithms in machine learning and everything, which uh, is kind of nice, but really our motivation was multi-agent systems. Um, now, ongoing and uh, future work. So, so I didn't talk about much about the asynchronous algorithms and algorithms subject to delays. So for asynchronous versions, I believe the algorithms uh, I presented at the beginning, they are, you know, work under asynchronism. Um, it's, you know, a, you have to see this in a way that you, you you have to split your maybe density of agents that react at different times, right, in different groups. But other than this, the results uh, follow. 
Uh, subject to delays, well, we haven't really looked into delays there and how that would be handled, but this is an interesting open, open question. And then I'm also interested in looking into heterogeneous populations uh, which have different uh, capabilities, right? How does that translate into large scales? And it's interesting for transportation problems. Um, and when I talk about uncertainty, then of course, there's the question of, okay, what is there is uncertainty in, not in the target density, but also in the transport brain. So how do you handle that? And maybe try to learn the uncertainty. Uh, that's a certain, I mean, it's very interesting and open question to me. Okay, so um, this is, I would like to thank the collaborators, different funding agencies, and these are the references where that contain most of what I've talked about. Um, and with this, I will take questions and I would like to thank you very much for your attention. I'll leave thank this. You for your fantastic presentation. So I think we have uh, today a presentation uh, with full, full of contributions. Um, and uh, I, I, I was interesting about the your future work in, uh, on the lady before, <laughs> and so I I, I start all your your developments on the the top so try to understand how the how can we try to improve the lady and uh, this one okay. yeah this implementation yeah so, I to me this is uh this is wide open you know the the case with delays um. You know, I don't know. I mean, as as <laughs> I mean, there are different considerations to make, right? But uh, I suppose the starting point would be to consider cases of homogeneous delays and progressively make the problem uh, harder. Uh, but then there's the the yeah, there's the question: How do you model this at the at the large scale? Uh, and then yeah, I I don't know how to approach it. So. But but for sure is is super relevant <laughs> because there are there are gonna be delays, and the only thing I can I can uh, handle I I can imagine how to do is when you have you know asynchronism so in the sense of but without delays right so um, so you know in, the, in these algorithms right every agent can say I have a different clock. And then I it's like I wake up, every alien wakes up, looks what's around, but then this is accurate information. And then with this accurate information, we'll update, right? So there are no delays there. And I think this is what we can, you know, the the algorithms we have, I think they should they should be able to to handle this. Certainly they do, you know, the, the microscopic versions do uh, because of, you know, known results that we have on coverage control, the macroscopic uh, proximal gradient version, I'm pretty confident this can be done. Although I don't have, you know, written down the, the proofs and, and everything, but I'm pretty sure this can be done. Uh, but it doesn't, you know, it has the assumption that uh, agents have perfect information. Now, if in addition you add the question of, okay, every agent is gonna have a different clock and at a given time, the agent wakes up, gets some information, and then it will implement after, or, or will get some outdated information. And after a while it will use that outdated information to update their control law, right? That is something I don't know <laughs> how to how to answer, but it's certainly very interesting. Yeah. By the way, I, I was thinking about you have tried these algorithms in uh, real robot, um, warming and so on. Can you repeat the question, please? Uh, have you tried uh, these algorithms with the real uh, robot? Oh. Uh, yeah, drones, I don't know. Yeah, well, I mean, um, so you are asking about implementation on real robots? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, we do have implementations on real on uh, our robotic testbed, but it's always with very small, uh, with a very small number of robots. No, so in our lab we have like around ten, mm -hmm. and um, 
I mean, there's a, <laughs> there are all sorts of problems, but yeah, we we have implementations with around, you know, six robots or so. You know how this works that when when um, you have ten robots, you switch them on, and half of it, half of them are not gonna work for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> But that you know, they they are very unreliable. We we have these turtle bots, um, and uh, anyway, so we but we do have experiments, and it shows it works with, you know, six robots or something like that. I I cannot do it with a you know, a thousand robots. Um, I would love to do that. I mean, all we have is the simulations. Uh, that show it works, but yeah, implementations we are far from that, <laughs> from that situation. Cool. <laughs> uh, guys, you, you can ask directly to Professor Martinez uh, if you have questions, or you can write in the chat. Oh, uh, I can look at the chat, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Ruan, I think Ruan uh, sent a message right now uh, about this possibility of writing, but uh, uh, you can ask the director, just open the mic and go on. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, uh, what? Go ahead, one. So I have one more, uh, Sonia. Okay. Uh, uh, I I don't know if it's too old, but uh, I remember when you try you were try you you talked about the uh, providing the Voronoi diagram. There is an algorithm. I think it's sweep sweep line out and something like that. What is the difference? Uh, uh, I know that it's different because uh, when you show your your slide, you can see that the uh, agents they they cover the region, but it seems that is more uniformly distributed than the quick line algorithm. There is any relation? Or oh, have you tried one? I don't know. So, uh, which algorithm are you talking about? The algorithms I showed here, or some other algorithm? Maybe you can write the name in the chat. Ah, okay. Let me show the name. I don't know if this is the correct name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know this uh, from the line. The sweep line algorithm. Uh, yeah. Is this is this an algorithm to computing Voronoi partitions? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, okay. First of all, these these are different uh, algorithms, right? Um, yeah, there is there is a there are these um, there is this sweep line algorithm. As far as I understand, is a way of given a set of generators, you compute a Voronoi partition of the of an environment, and then, of course, I mean it's a it's a computationally efficient program. It's uh, using all of the information of all the agents and the environment. Okay. Um, so in our case, uh, you can assume you could use an algorithm like that in order for the agents to come up with their own Voronoi region. So it's something they could use as part of our uh, algorithm, right? The thing is that now you got, you have to go beyond, you have to use those regions to compute where to move, no? And so they adjust the motion to the center of mass of the region and and that's what they do. Okay. Yeah. So so it could be used as part of now the the uh, an interesting question is uh, how can agents individually compute these regions with local information? That would be a good question because in principle, right? So if you um, you know if you go here to these partitions, okay. So. I hope you can see them, right? So those are these polygons, right? And uh, for example, for this agent over here in the, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but yeah, for yeah. this 
for this agent on the uh, on the corner on the top uh, right corner right that has a very large region right so um and indeed the larger the region it is the you know the larger the communication region uh, radius an agent needs in order to figure out this region right but um if there are you know, a large number of agents, and this is what we contend that if we, there are a large number of agents, then typically the regions are gonna be small, regular, you know, uh, usually you have a very small number of other uh, neighbors around, and that, you know, could be handled uh, on average, right? So, so on average, yes, you can use uh, distributed local information in order to come up with this regions individually uh, so so but yeah there, there's this uh if you consider other partitions not like the standard one then this could be more difficult right so i don't know if you saw for example um there are these these bottoms i mean it depends everything depends on what you consider to be your cost no of reaching other points or how do you make the assignment from points in the environment to agents, right? But if these costs have to do with, for example, some dynamics, like for example, flow on a river or something like that, then the regions become like very narrow bands and very, very long. And in that case, uh, it's really hard to come up with a distributed computation uh, for each agent. So so that's, uh, that's one aspect that you have to account for, you know, no, you can, you know, for general, very general costs that are not Euclidean, given by Euclidean metric, then it may be hard for uh, distributed computations to, to be available because you need more and more global information um, uh, to do this. So, Sonia, I think I have one question here. <laughs> uh, you is, can it possible, or... is it possible to add uh, constraints uh, forbidden positions yes okay so exactly so this is a very good question um, it, yeah you can add constraints uh, for example on for example you can consider constraints on the on the dynamics right so instead of being having a first order integrator uh, you have other dynamics this is going to give you a more complicated equations right um, and uh, it's more difficult to control agents, right? Um, but it's certainly possible, but you know, the, the solution is harder. And sometimes if your equations are very difficult, right? Since this relies on optimization, then you will have problems that, you know, become more non-convex or harder to, to, to solve. And it's specifically when you consider regions in the space that are forbidden, like obstacles and things like that, that introduces non-convexity into the problem because the domain of, of you are optimizing over, I mean, is not convex, is non-convex uh, now, right? And so you could apply the same algorithms and ignore, you know, just not, don't move to the forbidden areas. But the, I mean, the issue is that the emerging solution that you can get could be really a suboptimal, okay? It could really look bad. <laughs> uh, so there's been people who have tried to address this, um, for ex but yeah, somehow um, they are not satisfied. I mean, they, all the solutions are locally optimal at best or else they require some global information. So for example, one uh, group of people took all of the holes of the environment and applied a, a transformation like a diffeomorphism, okay? And then uh, by doing this diffeomorphism, they shrink the holes and obtain another environment without any holes. And then they did, they, they implement the algorithm there in the transform domain, and then they come back to the original one, expanding the holes back up, and then it looks very nice. But I mean, that requires the, the the information to do this transformation, right? And robots have to be aware of this. So yeah, but, but it's a solution, right? So there are some things you can do. <laughs> okay. 
I don't know if you have more questions. No, probably you are counting about the next uh, talk, right? So I think we, we should thank Sonia for this great time with us. Uh, I, I enjoyed it a lot. So I hope the other guys uh, have learned the many things too. So I think this is all. Thank you, Sonia, for everything. Thank you and very much. Course, back to you for sharing the information and ask for others. Right? Yeah, well, I... I I would like to to thank you very much for the for the invitation again, and I was very happy to speak with you. And uh, yeah, please reach out uh, anybody if you have any questions or would like to follow up on on some topics. I would be very happy to do this. So, thank you, Chavo. Thank, thank you a lot, Professor Sonia Martinez, for your amazing talk. <laughs>